open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4. If you don't have a traditional Bible, but you'd like one and you're comfortable, just raise your hand. One of my friends will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. You can also open up the YouVersion app. Or it's also called the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures. Those have already been uploaded. And we'll put the scriptures up on the screen right behind me as well. If you're watching us online or at one of our other gatherings, I love you. So glad that you guys are part of our family. Super glad that you guys are part of our family recovering from the holiday weekend. And I hope that you had a good week. And I hope that all your headaches are gone and all of your stomach aches are gone and all the burger aches and the hot dog aches and all the aches that you get from the 4th of July. We had some fireworks that went off behind our house. When you're from Detroit, you don't know if those are fireworks or shotguns. You start tripping. I, I jumped up off the couch like, I wish you would. <laughs> Sometimes 4th of July could be a, a scary holiday. So anyway, uh, uh, this is the last message in this series. I, don't, I hope that you've had fun. I hope that you've been reading through 2 Timothy. You've had time to read through it a bunch of different times. It's less than 90 verses and so to go eight weeks on a group of scriptures. This little passage of scripture seems very untheological, and uh, yet I think it's probably the most important part of the whole book. And so uh, a few years ago, I ran a Honolulu marathon, and the race starts at 5 a.m. So at about uh, 3.45 to 4 a.m., I showed up at the starting line with 10,000 of my closest friends, and as they gather you, they line you up in groups, and you're grouped by your mile time. And, and so the first group that they put in the front, they were all professional runners. Every one of these people is running a four-minute mile or faster. And, and they put the professional runners in the front because they don't want people like me getting in their way and people like them running people like me over. And, and uh, this runs actually what you call a qui qualifier, which means that if you finish it within a certain amount of time, you qualify for the Boston Marathon, which is the most storied and prestigious marathon in the world. And so the field, it was stacked with superstars. Uh, one of the guys had just won the London Marathon. Another one had just won the Berlin Marathon. One of the guys had won an Olympic gold in the marathon. Another was the fastest marathon finisher ever with a previous time of two hours and three minutes. He was the closest guy in the world at that time to breaking the two-hour marathon, which he would go on and do just a few months later. He was the eventual winner of this whole race. He finished with a time of two hours and 12 minutes. That means he averaged a five-minute mile for 26.2 miles. I remember seeing him twice. I saw him at the beginning, and then I saw him at mile nine. Not, well, I passed him at mile nine, except I was going this way, and he was going this way, because the, the route goes like this, and then it wraps around. So when I was at mile nine, he was at mile 21. He was already wrapping the thing out. What was fascinating is that when the gun went off, these professional runners, they took off at a near sprint. See, they weren't only built for this. They'd also been trained for it. Uh, but watching those guys do that, it had an effect on other people in the race. You could see the second wave of runners taking off with the same vigor, trying to maintain the same pace. And, and these runners in the second wave are typically incredible runners. To be in the second wave, you have to be able to run at least a five-minute mile. The problem was, although some of these people were built for that pace, they hadn't been trained for it. And it didn't take long before runners in the third and the fourth wave started passing the runners in the second wave because those second wave runners hadn't properly managed their pace. What's interesting is more runners from the second wave failed to finish the race than any other wave, including my wave, which was filled with people who run north of 10-minute miles. And you know, I've seen this same thing happen when it comes to our faith, to our spirituality. A lot of people start out strong. I've seen it time and time again. People who come out of the gate with, with a bang. They give their lives to Jesus, make a bunch of changes, start telling everyone they know about Jesus, like who he is, what he's done in their lives, and then adversity. Somebody doesn't buy into it. Somebody doesn't believe they change. Somebody 
talk trash or talk smack to them, and they fall back into old crowds, old habits, old ways, and next thing you know, they just drop out of the race and go back to their old life. And quite honestly, people like that have done Christianity more harm than they've done good. See, the world is full of fast starters. It's not how you start that matters. Just ask the tortoise and the hare. What really matters is how you finish. I want to talk about that today in a message we're calling Finish the Race. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for who you are, for what you do, for everything you have done in us, God. Thank you for the changes that you've made. And we do get excited about it, God. Don't get me wrong. We get so excited about what it is that you've done in our lives. But God, I want to be just as excited 20 years after you've made a change in my life as I am 20 minutes. And so God, for me, for my friends in this place, I pray that you'd breathe wind into our sails. Put it under our wings, God, so that when we leave this place, we'd be less like us and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when it came to following Jesus, Paul, who wrote this letter, he was not a fast starter. He, he actually was relatively late to the game. He'd never met Jesus in the flesh. He hadn't followed him, sat at his feet, witnessed his miracles, listened to his parables. He never drank the wine that he had changed from water. He never heard the sermon on the mount. I mean, he was actually an open opposer. He had dedicated his life to crushing Christ's cause until he had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life. And from that encounter on, he dedicated his life to undoing all of the damage that he'd done in the past. And like if Paul were a pitcher in baseball, he, he wouldn't have been a starter throwing a nine-inning, no-hit, perfect game. He, he would have been a reliever. He, he would have been a closer with a wicked fastball. Like he was raised in the religious system. None of the things that Jesus had said were new to him. He just actually thought that they were wrong. He, he, he grew up with a dream, with a destiny to be the high priest, the highest position in all of Judaism. He was trained at the best schools and sat underneath the most prestigious rabbi teacher in all of Judaism. He, he was built for it and he was trained for it. But after his encounter with Jesus, he used all that training as an academic to take Christ's cause to levels and places it never could have gone through Jesus' disciples. Like he debated with the Greeks. He confronted the Romans. He brought the gospel to the Gentiles, an entire group of people that had been closed off to prior to him. He, he risked his life starting churches all over the Roman Empire in cities that no one had ever even thought of. He wrote these letters that would end up comprising more than half of our New Testament. Like he didn't start fast. But man, when he did start, he more than made up for lost time. But I think what's more fascinating than Paul's accomplishments is his endurance. Paul was a finisher. He was a closer when you read the scriptures and history, he endured more hardship than any two men combined, and yet still, somehow, he finished the race. In fact, in his second letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've constantly been on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from my fellow Jews and from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, and from false believers. I've labored and I've toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold and I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concerns for all these churches I started. He says, who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. This guy, Paul, he went through it. But he had courage. He had fortitude. He had grit. And here we catch him at the end writing his last letter to his spiritual son, Timothy. And, and over the course of the past two months, we've, we've talked about a list of directives that Paul gives to Timothy in regard to carrying out this apostolic calling on Paul's life. And it culminated last week with the central command to Timothy and to us to preach the word. And it's rich. This is robust. This book is it's, it's deep. There's so much 
to these few verses. And so after he's finally given all of the directives, we get to this spot that we're at, which again, I think is perhaps the, the, the most robust and the most difficult part of it all. It's the most important part of this entire letter. It's because after he gives all of these directives, after all of the business is done, Paul shows his humanity. And, and in these last few verses, I want you to understand the context probably more than any other week. Paul, Paul is lying in a Roman prison. It's difficult for us to put that into context because sometimes you've watched on Discovery Channel the shows about prisons and you go, huh, I don't even have cable. Like you think these guys, like it's, it's different. It's like a Roman prison was unlike any prison the world had ever seen. I mean, there were, there were some people, let me be clear, there were some people that when they were arrested in the Roman Empire, they were allowed to be under house arrest. And one time Paul was that. Paul was allowed to be under house arrest in a friend's home, and he was chained to Roman guards 24 hours a day. Three shifts of Roman guards were chained to him, and he got to share the gospel with them eight hours a day, three different guards. It was incredible. It was like Paul was so psyched about it. But this is different, y'all. This is a wrap for Paul, and he understands that. Uh, like, like the prison that he would have been, I don't know if you've seen the new Matrix before, but the new Matrix where it has like the little pods where they're like stacked up and you have like the probes in, in people's heads, they copied that off of a Roman prison. And a Roman prison in Paul's day would have been layers, it would have been stacks, it would have been like coffins of of cage that, that they would have stacked one on top of each other, almost just big enough for a person to, to lay inside of it. And, and, and Paul, you know, he would, have, he would have had to figure out how, how was it that he would have written this letter by the little bit of light that was filtering down because dependent upon the severity of your crime was the level with which you were held on within a Roman prison. So, so Paul may have been six people deep. There, 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 there's no floor on the prisons. I, did, I want you to imagine the grotesqueness of that, the things that can uh, fall and filter down from level one to level six. And, and Paul finds himself in this, in this prison, this dungeon, this cesspool, this, this unimaginable end to a prolific life. Cold, lonely, abandoned, well aware that this was the end. And, and Paul is well aware because at this point when he writes this letter, he's already stood one trial and he lost. And as a Roman citizen, he understood the outcome. Once you lost the first trial, they didn't do a retrial to let you off. They did a retrial to give you your punishment. And that retrial almost always happened within one week. And so Paul has, Paul has already stood trial. He's already lost. He already knows the income of the outcome. He already knows the fate that awaits. He understands that within a few days of writing this letter, he's going to be dragged to the center of the city and he's going to be executed in some sort of bloodthirsty, barbaric way. As the de facto leader of this Christian movement within the Roman Empire, he knows that he's going to be used as an example, that his death is going to serve like the cutting off of the head of the snake, that it, he, he understands that his as soon as word spreads of his death, that hundreds of believers across the empire are going to flee the faith in lieu of his faith. And so with all of that in context, in, in writing to the heir of his ministry, he says, do your best to come to me quickly. And, and see, when you don't know the backdrop, when you don't know the context, those are just words on a page. They're, they're so two-dimensional. But I want you to understand that when Paul wrote those, those words, he would have understood that Timothy coming quickly would have been impossible. L like it would have taken Luke, who would have transported these words, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, incidentally. It would have taken Luke weeks to get this letter to Timothy. And then if Timothy would have immediately dropped everything and returned to greet Paul, it would have taken Timothy weeks for him to get back. And, and Timothy wouldn't have known this. But Paul understood that Timothy was never going to make it in time to see him. But Paul wanted Timothy to get there so that he could hold the believers together. Talk about selfless. 
He says, that's just verse 1. He says, he says, so come to me quickly because Demas, because he loved this world, he's deserted me and he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens, he's gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you because he's helpful in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Doesn't that sound like a rap song? I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you came, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. These are the scriptures. He's saying, bro, like, understand this. He knows he's not making it to him. Do you understand what the, he's saying? All of the things that I've written, all the letters, all of the correspondences, all of the scriptures, the Old Testament scrolls, I need you to bring them to this city. I need you to bring them to the epicenter of the world, to the, to the seat of the greatest kingdom that the world has ever known. Because Alexander the metal worker, he did a great deal of harm to me. The Lord, he's going to repay him for what he's done. You need to be on your guard against them because he strongly opposes our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. And when I picture that, I think about the embarrassment of that. That Paul, this great champion of the faith, this great voice of a movement of people, stands trial alone, solo, that no one cared enough about him to be in his stead. And it almost is reminiscent of when Jesus stood his trial and no one was next to him. He says, at my first offense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me, but don't hold it against him. The Lord, he stood at my side and he gave me strength so that through the message, through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. This isn't a, like, this is a metaphorical lion. This isn't a real lion. The, in the Greek, he's talking about Lucifer. He's saying, God delivered me from the hand of the enemy. I almost called this message between two lions. That he, he, he lived his life between the lion of Judah and the lion who prowls around looking to devour people. Anyway, he said, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord, he'll rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to heaven, heaven's kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he says, hey, by the way, Greet my homies. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and, and, and the whole household of Onesiphorus. Uh, uh, Erastus, he stayed in Corinth. I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Uh, so do your best to get here before winter. And he's saying that because once winter hits, the seas are too rough for you to be able to sail. Do your best to get here before winter. Eublis greets you and so does Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. Grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. The Lord be with you. And these final words are Paul's final attempt to finish the race, to hold together what God had started through him, to further his apostolic calling. It's why he lists Crescens, Titus, Tychicus, Carpus, Erastus, and Trophimus. The, these were all guys that he had either sent to or left at churches to run them and to grow them. Like he was wanting Timothy to understand. These guys, they're not like Demas. These guys, they didn't abandon me. You're going to show up and they're not going to be here. But I need you to understand that I sent them. I need you to understand that this movement that we've started, it doesn't die with me. It's in good hands. Like he's telling Timothy, I want you to take up the mantle of this ministry and take the gospel to places that it had never been, to people it's never been available to. And I think these words are so appropriate for us because in our culture we are so dependent upon a guy who stands on a stage to be the guy who delivers a message but I, I may never meet your neighbors I may never meet your cousins I may never meet the people who come to your businesses and your restaurants like I may never have an interaction with them Paul never met 90% of the people who came to faith he never met you he never met me and yet my faith has been founded largely upon three people Jesus, Paul, and David. I've never met any of them. And yet, the people who you have in your life who I will never meet, if, if you've been impacted through me, then they should be impacted through you. And so Paul does this thing, like this spreading of what it was that God started through him through a few ways. First, he did it through urgency. There is an urgency to this. I don't know if you recognize this, but it feels like we're in the end time. It feels like if, if the rapture is a real thing, it could happen today. When did we stop living like Jesus Mike could come back today? Like when I first got saved, I used to want to sin. Like, so I, I, can I just be, can we just be like two cats? I didn't stop sinning. 
because I stopped loving sinning. Ooh, I used to love to sin. <laughs> sinning feels good. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes, sometimes you don't get the same feeling on a Sunday morning that you get on a Friday night. I'm just saying, it just, it, feel, it feels good. You know what I'm saying? It's just, uh, uh, I didn't, like, I, I stopped sinning because I saw a movie one time where there was a pot that was boiling on the stove and Jesus had come back and somebody, grandmama, got taken to heaven and they got left. And I didn't want to walk in somebody's house and find a pot boiling on the stove. There was a fear in me that if I didn't stop sinning, I was going to go to hell. And there was like this urgency that I had in my early faith that I think has been lost on our culture, that we need to live our lives with this urgency that the people in your life, it may be the last opportunity today when you see them at a cookout. It may be the last opportunity that you get to share Jesus. And so Paul, he delivers it with this urgency. Like he says, Timothy, come to me quickly before this thing unravels and the church is splinter. So he does it through urgency. He does it through forgiveness. It's why he says, bring me my cloak. And then he uh, lists Eublis, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia. These were all followers of Jesus who were currently living in Rome. Like these were people who could have easily brought Paul a cloak but they didn't because they lacked the courage to do so out of fear of what would have happened to them. They were all people who'd started out fast, people who may have been built to run this race, but they clearly hadn't been trained to run it. And so now Timothy would have to take upon himself the responsibility to finish their training. So he did that. He did this through repentance, Paul did. He, he did it through restoration. It's why he told Timothy to bring Mark with him because Mark was the living example of Paul's biggest failure. He was the living example of Paul's biggest mistake. In one of Paul's earliest missionary journeys, if you remember my series on the book of Acts, Paul was like boys with a guy named Barnabas, and they were so close. And so Barnabas brings his cousin, Mark, on a missionary journey, and just as they're about to launch into the difficult part of the journey, Mark dips out. Have you ever had somebody dip out on you? Mark abandons them, and when he abandons them, it creates this huge chasm between Paul and Barnabas, the, the two guys that were advancing the gospel like it had never been advanced before, and it created a huge rift within the Christian community, and history tells us that Paul and Barnabas probably never spoke again because of what Mark had done. And Paul recognizes that that was an error on his behalf, that Paul in his pride, have you ever operated in pride? Have you ever operated in your old self, in your flesh? And Paul was so belligerent. He, he was such a strong-willed, bullheaded leader. You ever meet somebody strong-willed, bullheaded? Don't elbow your spouse. Like, you ever meet somebody bullheaded? And Paul, finally, at the end, when he says, bring Mark to me, this is Paul admitting his mistakes. And he wrote these final words with these final examples to challenge Timothy and ultimately us to do those same things, to hold together what he'd started, to stand in the face of adversity, to not bend or break under the pressure that our culture is trying to inflict upon us, to have courage, to have fortitude, to have grit, to fulfill the apostolic calling. To, to take what God's been doing over the past 10 years here in Green Bay and to take it to groups of people that's been completely closed to. Who in this city have we not reached? Who in this city ha have we not cracked the seal on, on their community? It, it, it's, it's this book challenging us to run two places that everyone else is running from, to, to go to places like Seattle and Portland, Detroit and Toronto, to, to have a sense of urgency, like to stop wasting our time on frivolous, meaningless things, but to seize the day, to preach the word, to share our faith with everyone whose presence God has trusted us with, to live in, to foster an atmosphere of forgiveness for the people who betrayed us, for the people who've let us down, uh, to live our lives uh, with a sense of repentance and a sense of restoration to own our own mistakes, to walk back our own failures, to rekindle the relationships that our failures have fractured with people, but more importantly with God. 
Could I say that it, it's a lot to ask in 14 verses. The, the richness of these 14 verses, the robustness of these 14 verses that we just skim over, that we just skip past, that we just kind of figure is a, is a sincerely yours. But the, the closing of this book is as important as any of the directives that he's given throughout the entire letter because none of what he asks in these last 14 verses is easy. It's not easy to live our lives in forgiveness. It's not easy to live our lives in repentance. It's not easy to live our lives with urgency because like our lives, they're just happening. You ever, you ever feel like, like life is just happening? Like, like you're just going through the motions? You, you ever feel like you're doing the same thing now that you did three years ago? You're using the same coffee maker. You're going to the same gas station. You're doing like all of the same things. And as though, although routine is comfortable, sometimes it becomes a crutch. And I think that God is challenging us to do something that we've never done, to go somewhere that we've never gone, to tell people that we've never imagined that we could tell, to take this message, these directives that God spoke through Paul to Timothy in just 87 verses and to install them into our lives. Because if we'll do this, and only if we'll do this, we'll be able to fight the good fight and finish the race. And so I wonder if you'll do that today. I hope you will. Because this race that we're in right now, it's a qualifier. Would you close your eyes all across this place? Uh, you know, it's a qualifier. What's it a qualifier for? It's a qualifier for the most storied race of all time, eternity. You know, at some point, everyone has to punch their clock, whether that's through Jesus coming back and rescuing and rapturing his church, or if it's through leaving this life and going to the next. I mean, there's thousands of people across the globe that are going to take their last breath today. And I wonder how many of them are ready. I wonder if that's you. I hope it's not. But if it's you, I wonder if you're ready to step out of this life and step into the next. See, the Bible, Bible says, blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. Like, if you know, you know. If you don't know, you probably know. And so the, the Bible says that there's two things that we really need to do uh, to be able to punch our ticket to step from this life into a life in the presence of God. He says you have to confess and you have to profess. Confess that you are a sinner, have sin in your life, and and number two, profess that Jesus can change you. So I want to give you the opportunity to do both of those things today and hear us out. In just a moment, I'm going to ask for people who don't have a relationship with Jesus but who want to, to do two things. Just first, with no one looking around, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. The, the, once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down. That's your way of confessing that you have sin in your life. Second, I'm going to say a few lines in a prayer, then I'm going to pause. And when I pause... I'm going to give you the opportunity to repeat what it is that I just said. And if you repeat what it is that I just said and you mean it in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. And so this morning, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but you'd like to have one before you leave this place with nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and make eye contact with me? Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Thanks. Okay, with nobody looking around, I'm going to ask you to say these words. Say, Jesus... I've got sin in my life, but I don't want it anymore. Take it. You can have it. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Make me different. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. With, the, with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, I wonder if you're here and you say, uh, Sean, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. but. How would I say this? You're in danger of not finishing the race. I don't know if there's doubt in your life. I don't know if there's a habit 
If there's a sin, there's, you know, something, an addiction, something that's in your life that you've thought about this. Some of you are in here and you've thought about this this week. You're like, man, I, I'm in danger of, like, you feel like you're slipping away. If that's you and you say, Sean, I'm in danger of finishing the race and I need to recommit with nobody looking around. Would you just raise your hand uh, so that I could see? Yeah. Yeah, God, for my friends in this place who are so bold and are so honest, I pray for strength. I pray for endurance. I pray for fortitude. I pray for grit in their life. God, we know this is not easy. I pray that you bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.